This presentation on beverage formulation steps and process flow diagrams is part of a workshop that was presented in St. Kitts and Nevis during February 2016. Financial support for this workshop from the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, IECA, is gratefully acknowledged. I would personally like to thank Mr. Augustine Merchant, IECA representative in St. Kitts and Nevis, and the IECA staff for their considerable efforts in making this workshop possible. We will begin with a brief introduction, followed by a discussion of good manufacturing practices and critical control points. Then we will look at process flow diagrams and construct a process flow diagram for mango-based beverages. We will end this presentation with a few summary comments. We need to take a look at the steps involved in producing a liquid beverage product in order to get an understanding of the critical steps involved. Good manufacturing practices, or GMPs, are often related to housekeeping and cleanliness. For example, it is imperative that all surfaces be clean and free from contaminants, so this is a good manufacturing practice. Things like this should be a given but they are often overlooked. You also need to be sure that your facility has various services. Potable water is quite important, as is good product flow. Then you also need to have a separation of raw materials and finished product in order to prevent cross-contamination of the finished product by the raw materials. Screen windows and doors are also a given. Proper wash-up facilities are required, as are proper washroom facilities and adequate ventilation. Insect and rodent deterrents are very important, and the list goes on. Critical control points, or CCPs, are points in the process that absolutely must meet specifications, or the product may pose a serious risk to the public health. For example, pasteurization requires a specific temperature for a required time period in order to be effective. Having a unique code date on the product packages is also a critical control point since it impacts your ability to trace the product in case of a recall. So here we see one of the beverages that was manufactured at the St. Kitts workshop and you may notice that there is a stamp here giving a code date that is actually a best before date. CCPs are different for different products and processes. Here is a special note regarding code dates. Code dates do not need to be complicated and secretive. They can be incorporated into a best before date or you can use a similar approach. So here we have an example of a best before date. Best before February the 16th 2017 at 307 p.m. What this will mean is that the product was produced perhaps on February the 16th 2016 at 307 in the afternoon and it has a one-year shelf life and this is the type of device that you can use for code dates and best before dates. Back to critical control points now. Hazard analysis and critical control points, or HACCP, is a separate topic that will not be covered in this workshop, but you may need to be HACCP certified to export products for sale in some areas or to some customers. Let's take a look at producing a mango-based beverage. We will begin with mango pulp and go from there. I would also like to say a special thanks to Mrs. Andrea Morton from the St. Kitts processing facility and Mr. Dwight Brown from the Nevis processing facility for their leadership roles in coordinating the workshops that were held during February. The best way to represent a process for any product is to prepare a process flow diagram or PFD. PFDs show each step in the process or each unit operation and they can be as simple as boxes labeling each step and linked with an arrow. A unit operation is a piece of equipment that performs a specific task. A dryer 
or a mixer or a grinder would each be an example of a unit operation. There are really no hard and fast rules for making a process flow diagram, but the main thing is that it provides a true and adequate representation of the process. You can begin by drawing a series of boxes to represent each step in the process and use arrows to show the direction of flow of materials or of other things such as air and water. And here we see this little diagram again down in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. If we were working with a dryer, we could show it like this, simply by drawing a box and labeling it as being a dryer. Now we know a few things about the dryer. We know that we have some form of feed into the dryer which tends to be moist, so we'll indicate that by an arrow going into the left hand side of the dryer box. Then we have dried product coming out as well, so we'll label that with an arrow leaving the dryer box on the right hand side. So how does the dryer dry? Well, it uses heated air which enters the dryer and that causes the evaporation of moisture from the feed and that will leave in the form of water vapor which we have indicated by the arrow leaving the top of the dryer box. Now we can begin putting together our process flow diagram for the mango based beverage. You may have a slightly different view of how it should be constructed but that's quite alright. You don't have to agree in every detail. We will begin with mango pulp that can be fresh or frozen. The desired amount of water is then added and if desired you can strain this mixture to remove the fibrous material. However, you can also leave the fiber in if you desire its contribution to the mouthfeel. When strained, a smooth textured liquid remains. So here are the process flow diagram steps. The first square labeled number one shows the mango pulp being fresh or frozen with the addition of water and then straining to remove fibrous material and a smooth textured mango liquid results. Then sugar can be added to get the desired sweetness and certainly citric acid should be added to give the desired pH. This is an important step so don't underestimate it and don't skip it. We take the smooth textured mango liquid, we add the sugar, and we add the citric acid in this part of the flow diagram. Then the flavors can be added as well as any other minor ingredients which may include preservatives or other additional ingredients, whatever the case might be. The ingredients must then be mixed thoroughly and a test for its bricks will indicate if the product is on spec with regard to its sugar content. So here we show after the addition of citric acid we've added the flavors and perhaps the other ingredients. We've mixed them thoroughly and now we're testing for the bricks. I've specified the target value here as being 12 to 13 degrees bricks which means 12 percent to 13 percent by weight of sugar. Sugar or water can be added if adjustments are needed. The product should then be pasteurized at a specific temperature for a defined period of time. So once it's tested and the adjustments are made, it can go on to the pasteurization process. In the workshops we used a batch process for pasteurization and the beverage was heated to almost the boiling point and held there for several minutes. Hot fill can be done with glass bottles, but the beverage should be cooled somewhat if plastic bottles are being used. Lids should be immediately placed on the containers and you should invert the bottles while they are still hot to heat treat the inside of the bottles in the headspace region. I have not indicated the inversion on this flow chart, but here you can see the filling, the capping and the cooling step before the products are cased, which we will describe in the next slide. The containers can then be cooled and the containers can be placed in cartons. Warehousing may be required at room temperature or at refrigeration temperatures and the product can then be distributed to the retailers for sale to the consumers. On the flow diagram I have indicated that after the casing 
The product will go to warehousing. I've shown room temperature, but it could be also refrigerated temperatures. The product is then distributed, and the box marked number 18, consumer, just gives a nice wrap up to the flowchart by showing that the product is now in the hands of the consumer. Here is the entire process flow diagram in only three sections. We begin with the mango pulp and proceed from there. We then add some water, perhaps we'll strain it if desired, and then we can add the minor ingredients, minor being in terms of weight percent. They would include citric acid for pH control, sodium sorbate as a preservative, and if you want to enhance the mouthfeel by a little bit of thickening, you can add pectin to it. Here is a picture of a person using a handheld refractometer to test the bricks of the solution. Now that the solution has been checked and any additions have been made, we can go to the pasteurization step. This pasteurization is being done over an open flame on a gas stove and the product will be constantly stirred and the temperature monitored. Once it has been suitably pasteurized, the product can be cooled somewhat to allow it to be filled into plastic bottles. Lids will then be placed on the plastic bottles and the bottles will be inverted. Here are the two examples of the beverages that were made in the St. Kitts workshop. The one was a mango passion nectar and the other one was mango juice. In Nevis, mango tango and mango passion were the two beverages that were made. Since preservatives were not used in the beverage in Nevis, they were placed immediately into a refrigerator and stored that way, whereas the ones in St. Kitts, which had some sodium sorbate in them, were able to be held at room temperature. Note that I have not included steps such as code dating and record keeping, etc. in the process flow diagram. These are extremely important steps and I would certainly not argue with anyone who would like to see those put into the process flow diagram. Code dating is actually a critical control point as we have mentioned previously. So let's take a look at the process flow diagram again and highlight a few steps. Water addition and sugar addition have been highlighted since they play a major role in meeting quality attributes. They are not critical control points, however. No one will become ill if you put a little bit too much sugar or not enough sugar into the beverage. That is strictly a quality issue. The addition of citric acid, however, could be considered as being a critical control point since it acts as a hurdle to microbial growth. If you do not add the citric acid, the pH may not be low enough and this can actually allow the growth of microorganisms. Its contribution to the taste of the beverage, though, is not a critical control point. Flavor addition and other minor additives can be mixed in at this point, and they are important for the quality of the beverage. The bricks of the beverage is a key measurable quality factor, but it is not a critical control point. However, pasteurization truly is a critical control point. Without the proper time and temperature in the process, microbial growth can occur with potentially hazardous results. Hot filling is part of the process to get the pasteurized product into the container without recontamination. As such, it could be considered as being part of this overall critical control point. Securing the cap or lid is the final part of the hot fill process as is the inversion of the container. It could be considered as being part of the overall filling critical control point. You should not have too many critical control points, however. In the sample process, the filling and capping are really a continuation of the pasteurization step. Often, people confuse good manufacturing practices, that is GMPs, with critical control points. A good exercise for you would be to sketch out a process flow diagram 
for each product you produce. You could then identify the good manufacturing practices that you need to follow as well as identifying the critical control points and defining the conditions that must be met. Thank you very much.